Robert Kennedy eulogized his brother, groping for a hold on his own future. It was expected that he would take up the torch. He was the heir to a growing legend. His brother had promised so much. Events had cheated him, had cheated those who had depended on him. It was inevitable that Bobby take his brother's place. mountain climb symbolized his plans for the future. In 1964, Bobby Kennedy was thinking about the vice presidency. He took a world tour, first to Germany. President Kennedy clearly saw the qualities of citizenship that have made your city a password of freedom. He saw clearly the quality of strength. Then to Japan. And Indonesia. Then Rome. And Poland. Everywhere, he reminded people of his brother. But Lyndon Johnson had no desire to have his administration sandwiched between Kennedy's. He had other plans. When he refused Bobby a place on the ticket, Bobby ran for the Senate against Kenneth Keating of New York. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we all know what we're here for. And, uh... I want to announce at the outset that I will not be a candidate for the United States Senate from Massachusetts. <laughs> Teddy Kennedy was up for re-election that year. His plane crashed on a campaign tour. The pilot died. Kennedy broke his back and was near death. Some people talked of the Kennedy curse. With his wife's help, Ted waged his campaign from his hospital bed. I'm uh, confident that I'll be on my uh, feet. I've been given these assurances by uh, some of the most able and capable doctors uh, uh, that uh, we could possibly have. And uh, so uh, uh, I'd, I'd probably uh, refer that question probably even more accurately to their uh, opinions. I take so their word for it. You have no doubt yourself. No, no. When would you vote to take your seat? Rose Kennedy campaigned for both of them, as did the other family members. That I've never had before. <laughs> to introduce my uh, son on a platform. I can tell you, of course, a great deal about him. <laughs> I used to spank him with the ruler. <laughs> but he really has been a great joy, and he is, he does work very, very hard. I want to uh, thank my mother for the kind introduction. <laughs> I thought we'd gotten down to this, this campaign after some of these polls came out that we were not doing too well. We took mother. Yeah, I know. I'm going to tell one of you. I uh, was up in uh, Syracuse, and the county chairman in Syracuse had been opposed to my nomination, George Van Lingen. And then the... Uh, no, no, he's a, one of the great uh, county chairmen. He just, <laughs> just didn't happen to like me. But then he spent a day with Mother, and uh, he wants to run her. Yeah, I know. Well, why don't you give your own speech? But see, that's it. We don't... Uh, my brother and I never... The reason she's never introduced any of us before is because we never go on the same platform with her. We couldn't possibly compete with that. Bobby won, Teddy won. ...saying that you only plan to New York, use New York State as a stepping stone, that your real goal is still the White House. Do you expect that you will be back in the White House? Well, I think there's somebody there 
And in my judgment, <laughs> I, I keep reading that, and I never see any statement by him that he's willing to move out. But, you know, so I think he's going to be there quite some period of time. Meanwhile, the war in Vietnam had become America's war. To withdraw from our responsibilities would endanger free men and free women everywhere and would bring the hope for peace to an end. I don't believe that you want to do that. I believe in victory, the victory of love over hate. The victory of man's hopes over man's fears. The victory of freedom over tyranny. And I believe you believe in that too. And I oppose the war in Vietnam because I love America. I speak out against it not in anger but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart and above all with a passionate desire to see our beloved country stand as the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I am disappointed with America. There can be no great disappointment where there is no great love. I have, uh, uh, I'm going to remain on as a, a United States Senator representing the state of New York and I'm going to support the Democratic ticket. 1968 of President Johnson Hubert Humphrey. Boo! Bobby, strongly opposed to the continuation of the war in Vietnam, was cautious about declaring his candidacy for president. He was also influenced by advisors who felt he should bide his time until 1972. The suffering in Vietnam was continually on his mind. And having judged that the war in Vietnam was a mistake without precedent in our history... Senator Gene McCarthy was bolder. He decided to challenge Johnson in the primaries, and many of Bobby's supporters rallied around him. We cannot stop with that judgment, but we're called upon to search out the causes and the conditions that led us into it. And this may require us to make the hardest and the harshest judgments about our national assumptions, about the institutions that embody them, and about some of the leaders who have become the spokesmen for this cause. Bobby isn't ready to announce his candidacy for the presidency yet. He doesn't think anyone else should announce either. But you, but you can be uh, sure that uh, Bobby will be in Chicago uh, for the convention next year. He's the only delegate who's reserved four floors at the Conrad Hilton. <laughs> and if he isn't nominated, he'll be the only father who will come home one night with 40,000 balloons. For 20 years, first the French and then the United States have been predicting victory in Vietnam, in 1961 and in 1962, as well as 1966 and 1967, we have been told that the tide is turning. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. We can soon bring our troops home. Victory is near. The enemy is tiring. Once in 1962, I participated in such a prediction myself. But for 20 years, we have been wrong. The history of conflict among nations does not record another such lengthy and consistent chronicle of error as we have shown in Vietnam. It is time to discard so proven a fallacy and face the reality that a military victory is not in sight and that it will probably never come. Are you advising him to run? Oh, I have conversations with him, but obviously these are personal matters. Do you think kept, he should uh, run? Kept between the uh, members of the family. Oh, I'm be careful of what you're saying to them. <laughs> In New Hampshire, McCarthy scored the incredible upset. The war had made Johnson far more vulnerable than almost anyone had imagined. 
In the midst of the McCarthy campaign, Bobby decided to run for the nomination. I run for President of the United States not because of the answers of the 1960s or not because I was involved in government during that period of time or pleased to be involved in government, but I run for President of the United States because I believe in the, in the ideals of this generation of Americans and I think we can do far better than neither of these the I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. We can make changes. We can deal with the violence, but we can also make changes so that everybody has an equal opportunity, no matter where they live. Once in the race, Bobby began to gain on McCarthy. He had started late, but he was closing the gap and was headed for a Chicago convention and victory. His hat was in the ring. But like Jack eight years earlier, he wouldn't put it on. Well, you fall down over my years, then you'd be embarrassed if you gave me a hat that was too big. Let me try it on in form. Okay. It didn't let you leave Fort Worth without providing you with some protection against the rain. <laughs> try it on in front of the mirror, quietly. I'll meet you back. I'll meet you in Washington. And we'll do it. I'll put it on in the uh, White House on Monday. If you'll come up there, you'll have a chance to see it there. <laughs> like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. At 7 p.m., Dr. Martin Luther King expired in the emergency room as a result of a gunshot wound in the neck. And further details will have to be obtained from the coroner's office. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. For those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with, be filled with hatred and distrust of the injustice of such an act, against all white people. I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poem, I. My favorite poet was Aeschylus. He once wrote, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States is not division, what we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. The feeling of justice.
toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. He tried to heal, but within 62 days, he too was dead. Thousands of trainside mourners lined the route to say their last goodbyes, and his words took on new meaning. We will have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of violence. It is not the end of lawlessness, and it's not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together want to improve the quality of our life and want justice for all human beings that abide in our land. Dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that. the greatest strength to him, to know that there were thousands of people all over the United States who were together with him, dedicated to certain principles and to certain ideals. No matter what talent an individual possesses, no matter what energy he might have, no matter what, how much integrity and honesty he might have, if he is by himself and politic particularly a political figure, he can accomplish very little. He wanted to do something for the mentally ill and the mentally retarded, for those who are not covered by Social Security, for those who are not receiving an adequate minimum wage, for those who did not have adequate housing, for our elderly people who had difficulty paying their medical bills, for our fellow citizens who are not white, who had difficulty living in this society. When I think of President Kennedy, I think of what Shakespeare said in Romeo and Juliet, uh, when he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars, and he shall make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. But I realize as an individual and really Those were the words Bobby had chosen in Jack's memory. be idealized or enlarged in death beyond what he was in life, to be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw war and tried to stop it. Those of us who loved him and who take him to his rest today pray that what he was to us what he wished for others will someday come to pass for all the world. As he said many times in many parts of this nation, those he touched and who sought to touch him. Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. In 68, Hubert Humphrey made it to the top of his party. He had come a long way since West Virginia. My fellow Americans, my fellow Democrats, I proudly accept the nomination of our party 
There was an attempt to get Ted Kennedy on the ticket as vice president. But after much sober thought, Ted refused. He had first to find the limits of his role as the new Kennedy patriarch, the father of three and Uncle Ted to Jack's two children and Bobby's 11. He was examining a new political role, one unhampered by the shadow of either Jack or Bob. President Kennedy defended America against the extremists. George Wallace is in league with them. President Kennedy fought for legislation that would ensure every citizen the right to vote. Known to the public George as the younger Wallace brother, Ted began to emerge in some ways as a better politician than either of the others. Fellow senators had already seen that Teddy, unlike the brothers, seemed better prepared to deal with the Senate on its own terms. And he was heir to the Kennedy style. My brothers believed in the dignity of man. How can those who stood with them support a man whose agents used cattle prods and dogs against human beings in Alabama? So it is not enough that this movement be defeated. It must be repudiated for the health of our country and our future as a nation. And I hope that the American people will take this opportunity to cleanse the stain of hate from American life. We're going to succeed. We're going to win. But Hubert's determination was not enough. I'll tell you, it isn't going to be like 48. Lots of things have changed. You remember, that was the year that Harry Truman won by giving him hell. Well, it won't work this time. Because just remember, I'm sure you will all agree with this, that it's one thing to give him hell, but it's something else to give him Humphrey, believe me. Richard Nixon, victorious, had vanquished Humphrey and outlasted the Kennedys. While the Nixon settled into the White House, Ted and the remaining Kennedys addressed fundraising dinners to pay off Bobby's campaign debts. What did I say? <laughs> Sorry about that, Senator. Nice fellow. The senior senator from Massachusetts, Edward Moore Kennedy. Let me say, uh, first of all, how... Uh, how much all of us appreciate the fact that you were here this evening. All of us in the family, I think, uh, owe a special word of thanks to uh, particularly Steve and uh, my mother because uh, uh, they have uh, been so attendant to detail, they've been uh, so efficient, and they uh, both use the same hairdresser. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> minority leader. <laughs> you fellas want to run him? <laughs> I think Steve would actually be a uh, great candidate in the state of New York. He's a... Uh, Irish Catholic, great name. He wears Italian suits. How can he lose? <laughs> it is true that uh, Steve will not be a candidate for governor next year because my mother is going to be. <laughs> but uh, let me just say, I, I wanted particularly mother to come uh, this evening because as perhaps many of you remember during the course of the Hard fought uh, Indiana campaign. Mother came out there to uh, Indiana. She made a remark at that time that uh, someone asked her about the expenditures of funds, and Mother said, well, why shouldn't we spend it? It's our money. <laughs> and so, uh, Mother, uh, it's particularly appropriate uh, that you come here this evening to... <laughs> to 
find out whose money we really were spending out of this. <laughs> Finest mother any family's ever had. Rose spoke often of Bobby. Bobby, of course, would come to see his father and me, usually the evening, at Hyannis. And he would always have one of the youngsters with him, another couple by the hand, his dog coming close behind. What joy he brought us. What a naking void there is without him. We admired him. We loved him. And the world is indeed bleak without him. A devoted husband, a beloved son, an adored brother. I know I shall not see his like again. I envy you people who are watching this generation and have a chance to inspire them and help them become leaders. I envy you because it is through your guidance that they can gain the courage, the foresight, and the ideals, the dedication to ideals, which can be stimulated and mobilized and lead so much to the success of this country, this land which we love so well, Jack used to say. You have wept with us in times of sorrow, and you have rejoiced with us in times of triumph. For all these tributes of affection, we are deeply grateful. Then, in July 1969, tragedy struck again. On the island of Chappaquiddick in the dark of night after an evening of partying, Ted Kennedy drove his car up a narrow bridge into the deep water. His passenger, Mary Jo Kopechny, a former secretary in Bobby's office, drowned. Kennedy survived, but he had failed to report the accident to authorities until nine hours later. The car that I was driving on an unlit road went off a narrow bridge which had no guardrails and was built on the left angle to the road. state of utter exhaustion and alarm. My conduct and conversations during the next several hours, to the extent that I can remember them, make no sense to me at all. Although my doctors inform me that I suffered a cerebral concussion as well as shock, I do not seek to escape responsibility for my actions by placing the blame either on the physical and emotional trauma brought on by the accident or on anyone else. There is no truth, no truth whatever, to the widely circulated suspicions of immoral conduct that have been leveled at my behavior and hers regarding that evening. There has never been a private relationship between us of any kind. I know of nothing in Mary Jo's conduct on that or any other occasion and the same is true of the other girls at that party that would lend any substance to such ugly speculation about their character. Nor was I driving under the influence of liquor. That winter, as a new generation of Kennedys walked the beach at Hyannisport, Joe Kennedy, so many joys turned to ashes, gave up his life. But for the others, life went on. Within months, there was a campaign for re-election to be waged and won. Teddy faced his responsibilities and dealt with them. Well, I try and uh, work hard in the United States Senate, and I work hard at uh, what I'm doing, and I'm working hard in this uh, campaign. But uh, really, this is uh, more of a, a benefit, uh, uh, really, to me. I've, I value the contacts I've had with people over the course of this campaign. Uh, I've learned a lot about their concerns and their interests. I think it's uh, important for a public official to, to have this kind of a 
campaign of rubbing shoulders with the people to listen to their concerns, to, to see the impact of a cut in Head Start program or when they're cutting out a milk program or the fact that they're the low uh, income housing or middle income housing just isn't being built or the meet the hundreds of senior citizens who can't get into a, a senior citizen program and this humanizes the issues. It is now more than 10 years since John Kennedy told us to ask not what our country could do for us but what we could do for our country. That was a phrase and a feeling that fired the imagination of entire generation of Americans and of people around the world. For all our citizens, rich and poor, north and south, business and labor, we brought a new awareness of the purpose of America. We brought a new respect for our basic civil liberties. We brought a new compassion to the strong. We brought new hope to all the weak. The idealism we had before may be just a spark today, but it is still there, waiting for the call that can fan it back to life.